nothing would have no borders or boundaries. If it had borders or boundaries, it would be a thing. But if I asked you what's everything, you'd be like, well, everything can't have any borders or boundaries because it, then it wouldn't be everything. So everything and nothing have the same definition. That's how I'd answer your question. <laughs> you get to take a little puff now. What's up, Ryan? Hey, man. So good to see you. Here we are. You're do in you, London? Yeah, I'm in London. Do you do you remember me in uh, any way other than I know you? a lot of people interview you, do a lot of talks, you meet thousands of people, but just out of, just out of curiosity, is, is my name familiar to you? Or Yes, I remember it. I, I was like, yeah, I've talked to him. Yeah, I know. I know him. Somewhere, sometime, I know him. Yeah. What's crazy is we spoke basically eight years ago to the day whoa yeah eight years ago to the day and it ended up being one long conversation and then you told me that you had been in a surfing accident and we should connect again the next day like you felt like you wanted to give me a little bit more and so we spoke again for an hour and then the internet cut out at your your place or something like let's do it let's do another round so we basically spoke on and off for like three hours eight years ago and that experience and the things that you said have led me on this crazy journey, which I'm hoping to unpack a little bit with you. And that's why the book, it just resonates with me. Like, I get it. Like, I get it. I get what you're talking about. I get what you're trying to say. And it all, <laughs> it all makes sense. And when I spoke to you, it didn't make sense. Like, I was hearing you and I was like, that's interesting, but I, I don't believe it. In the sense of like it was it was too radically inclusive, it was too open minded. I I loved it, and I was it was not a a disagreement kind of interview. But I was like, man, I wish I could believe that. I just wish I could believe that. And now I fully believe it. I fully believe it, and I feel like I've experienced sort of similar, profound, mystical things that I believe you're you're pointing us towards in this book. <laughs> and uh, so, of course, and I wouldn't expect you to remember it. It was it was. A, in your mind, potentially not generic interview, but you I know. do remember it. There's no such thing as a generic interview. I yeah. do remember it. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. I remember that. So basically, just wanted to say thanks so much for doing this and so great to see you again. And this basically, is great. yeah, I wanted to start a little bit of um, just to say to say thank you, you know, for, for the influence you've had, the sort of way that your work has been transformative and uh, so inclusive uh, in my own thinking and growth and what what I conceive God to be. Um, and it's exciting because I feel like I'm catching you at a point in your life where you're on this new, this new plane and this new wave. And to me, it's super exciting. And it also makes total sense. Um, so I first of all wanted to say, to say thank you just as a way to start this off. No, oh, that's very, that I receive it. Awesome. That's great. That's yeah. very moving to me. It's very moving. And, You've written this new book. I got it right here. I've got the, the physical copy. Made it all the way just in time for the interview. I was reading it on the, the e-book. Uh, Where'd you park your spaceship? And, you know, it seems like, and you've talked about it, this total departure from anything you've done. But to me, I was like the trajectory. If this is like the everything is spiritual triangle of you and your journey, I was like, oh, yeah, this totally makes sense when I heard yeah. about yeah, the yeah. concept of the book. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting, what might be a little bit different is the non-specific direct references to Jesus. There's no, the word Jesus can't be found in these pages. The Bible verses aren't quoted. But what's interesting is you, you talked about this thing that I found super profound, that Jesus told you to do that. <laughs> and I'm, wondering, I'm wondering if we could start with that. Isn't that fun to talk? Isn't that fun to just say that? Just to say that and just keep going? Just to be like, yeah. I just, it just makes me laugh. Yeah, Jesus the Christ showed up and was like, hey, this is awkward. You've been telling my stories for 30 years. Like, you have your own stories. <laughs> it's just funny to tell people that with us, you know what I mean? Like, just to go, just to double down and go straight through. Like, yeah. What, what, you think he didn't? What in the world? You know what I mean? 
these aren't the droids you're looking for. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> when you yeah when you, when you say that though, like you you have a relationship with Jesus the Christ, as you as you said. What, what his last name, his middle name and last name, the Christ. The Christ. Yeah. <laughs> when you talk about talking with him and having that friendship, what what are you in a literal sense? What is this? What are these experiences like for you? And how would you describe them if you can? Yeah, that's the thing, is it smashes to pieces what you mean by the word literal. It's like a knowing. Yeah, think about how much of your think of how think of how much of the experience of your life that has felt felt most real. The experience had no need to convince your mind. It's like it just went right around your mind, went right to the center of your being. That we live in a world that has, especially the Western Enlightenment tradition, has worshipped at the altar of the mind. If you can comprehend it, then it's real. When human history, for thousands and thousands of years, human beings have understood that the your mind is something happening within you. It's helpful here and there. Regulates your nervous system. And you can do your taxes. But that you think about music, like you play a song for somebody, and they immediately start trying to think of what bands it reminds them of and analyzing it. And you're like, oh, God, <laughs> really? How does this compare? What? You know, I feel like their sound is, oh, God, just listen to the song. You know what I mean? <laughs> so just so interesting how we actually yes we think and we analyze and we process and we discern but also like how we actually navigate life falling in love you know what i mean well she checks nine of the ten boxes what you talk you know what i mean <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah and 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 i this uh profound sense the christ comes to show us who we are. So even that idea like uh, like in church world, like it's all about Jesus. No, it's not. No, it's not. That's a ridiculous statement. No, because <laughs> Jesus was all about humans being humans. He himself would be like, that's the dumbest thing ever. Or even think about praise songs to Jesus, singing to Jesus. If he was there, what would he do in that moment? It would be very awkward. We, you and I can barely get through happy birthday. Happy birthday to you is awkward. Who do I look at? What do I do? You know what I mean? You'd be like, no, no. I and my divinity come to speak to you and your divinity. Like that's the whole thing. So the idea of it keeps someone a child to keep. Uh, the only guru who can actually help you is the guru who keeps reminding you, Ryan, that you don't need a guru. Although, you, from time to time, we need a guru to remind us that we don't need a guru. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's so interesting. And, you know, there was a thing you said to me all those years back that this is one, one of the moments of the tidbits that you put into my mind that started to change me. What you said, you could just tell that there was something that was m making me curious to keep my wanting to talk about Jesus, to, to care about Christianity, even though I was extremely agnostic. And you said you've had an experience with the risen Christ. And I remember at the time being like, what does that mean? And I've meditated on that for years. And then it sounds like what you're talking about is this, like a literal experience, that in, ineffable experience with the risen Christ. But I'm wondering when you, when you meet Jesus, when you talk to Jesus, which doesn't sound silly at all to me, it sounds absolutely awesome. What, it, what kind of like physical state are you in? Is it a is it a white light kind of state? Is it a is it on your surfboard kind of state? Like, can you describe it to me? Because I feel like I've tasted what you've tasted, and I just want to hear it in your own words, if if you don't mind. It's always an awareness of love. It's like a, it's the it's the love. that is actually so free of judgment and shame that 
you inevitably see things about yourself that are to be left behind, confessed, make amends. So it does way more than any judging or shaming could ever do. Because you see. So, like, you see what's in your shadow. You see who you actually are in the ways. It's not a learning, it's an unlearning. It's not a knowing, it's an unknowing. We don't actually need more information. We need silence and stillness and spaciousness in which our true selves shine through. And then it becomes very clear. Oh, look at the things I've picked up along the way that I can just set down. So this idea that you need to get anywhere, no, stay exactly where you are. This idea that there's some information that if you had it, no. You have everything that you need. You just grabbed hold. Cl you, you were clinging and grasping to a number of things that we can let go of. It's easier. It's not, it's, it's easier. It's more flow, more ease, more release, more liberation. Yeah. I, I, I had this epiphany. I'm wondering if you can relate to it when I've been in these kind of states that you come up it's just that i would describe it as meeting pure love in, in a way or and it's it's the best everything's going to be okay kind of feeling in the most profound way possible and yeah. you never come out of that state and say oh yeah gay people are going to hell or you never come out of that state yeah. and you're you're angry at somebody nobody who describes these experiences come out with hate and it seems to just tell me it reaffirms sort of the authority to say things so boldly. I wonder if that's also, you know, those experiences really aff affirm that and you, you hear that from other people who can relate to what you're saying. Well, it's only ever about us. So generally what we see is the ways in which we have taken what we are most terrified is true about us and placed it on someone else. So... It's not about fixing them, changing them, tweaking them. Anything in that person who has activated me in some way is, uh, I can inevitably find it in myself. Well, you think about a parent, every single thing pretty much that the parent could find to be anxious about in the child, guaranteed with some stillness, silence, and self-inquiry, the parent will be able to find that in themselves. So do your work. That's the gift to the world. So, so from, for many people, we see the interior and exterior as having a boundary between them. So there's the world out there, there's the conflict out there, and then there's my interior. But there is no border between those. So if you want peace in some other far corner of the world, you do your work and self-inquiry now on your own deepest insides. This is how the world actually shifts. The whole, the whole world is in there. Interesting. And I wanna, I wanna keep unpacking these themes because they, they would totally relate to the book. And, but right before we shift to the book, which is just, it's, just, it's fascinating. You know, you talked this experience with, with, with Jesus, meeting the, Jesus the Christ, and it's like, go tell your own stories. But you talked, <laughs> you've talked a little bit about the sort of- well, He's that, funny, you, by the way, he's yeah. funny. How so? He's funny, so? he's winking. And he's like in on the joke and he's two steps ahead. So he's not like blessed is the one who's in on the joke. Like he's, he's winking and he's like, seriously, dude, seriously, you're going to plan it hurling through space at 66,000 miles an hour. Come on. <laughs> so there's always a lightness. It's the only way to get to anything that you would call serious. There's the only way in. You have to come in through the side door metaphor, riddle, joke, analogy, parable. Uh, 2,000 years ago, a guy owns a vineyard, lady sick and goes and tries to find a healer. Like, that's how you come into this. No, that's how we actually, that's how we actually wake up is, we don't know, we, we had a dream? What? You know what I mean? A guy on the subway said to us Cleveland and we were like, oh my God, you're right. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, go through and ask people moments when they, the, whatever you call it, breakthroughs, transformations. You talk to people about the deepest experiences of life in which they saw in some new way. It's all, 
You know what I mean? It's always. Yeah. And I pulled over by the side of the road because there was this thing. I heard this song. Someone gave me a casserole. You know what I mean? Like, think about you. If you were to, it, if you were to tell us how did Ryan become this Ryan, and you were to tell us about the past 13 Ryans on the way to this Ryan, it would be the most bonkers. There's no plan. And, and it would involve lots of you probably telling stories about making plans that just blew apart. But then this other thing emerged. So unknowing is actually how you found your way. <laughs> so the, the, yeah, so the Christ is like, Jesus the Christ is in on all that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think his life probably exemplified that in so many ways. And just this idea, and I'm, because fascinating, you know, I grew up in the church, um, still connected to it in some way. I don't go in a formal way, but I'm, you know, try to pay attention to what's happening in the church. It's obviously very disappointing for me a lot of the times from what I can see from where I am. But this idea of you feeling this relief and burden to be like, I'm going in a different direction. And I'm not didn't feel like a burden. <laughs> it didn't feel like the, the heaviness, though, perhaps of the last 30 years of engaging in that world, trying to perhaps make your mark in that world and then realizing that you were ready for a change and you had been given this permission. What was can you talk a little bit about that burden or maybe I'm misinterpreting what what you were saying about it? It's always felt. It's always been like an endless exploration. It's always felt like following that which can't be named and arranging my life around it and seeing where it goes. Wonder and awe has been, wonder and awe has been the engine. So it has not felt like departures as much as just obvious next steps. It's never really felt like, well, no, there are, there have been moments of, but the moments were never the, the moments that would, whoa, this is new, always had with them like a permission giving, like, could, could it be this good? And all the standard wobbles and fear and trembling of, uh, is it good can be terrifying. For many of us, it's, it's very easy to develop a, a lens of cynicism. If something's good, then it's too good to be true, as opposed to it's good enough to be true. So for many people, a, the good arises within them and asks them to them to follow it, and instantly the guard goes up. What's the catch? As opposed to, yeah, of course, the universe is a place of great love. It's been expanding for billions of years. It's on my side. Of course, it would be a wondrous thing to be a human being. And so it, uh, this, what you're specifically speaking of is just this awareness that I had been doing a particular thing in regards to God, Jesus, Bible, uh, ba involving babies and bathwater, involving, and that's a, like, you think about that in, in history, that's, that's, it is a role, like a textual, the cleric, the scribe, the, that is like a role people have played to, to speak to a tradition and to interpret its text. People have done that for a long time. That's like a job. Yeah. At some level. And for me, this moment of, God, I've got all these stories. My computer's full of all these different stories. And like, yeah, but, I, you know, I have a thing I do. And it was so generally this wonder and awe that arises within you and this curiosity and this exploration will generally call into question some something you've constructed about your sense of self and identity. And that's just a fluid. That's just a thing. You need to set that down. Well, I'm a... Okay, maybe you were last week. You don't have to be this week. You know what I mean? Like, identity is just a thing. It's just a thing you made. It's just a thing you made up. You can you can make it up and you can take it apart. You don't have to be. You, you were the CEO. That's nice. You want to go like work at Target? Great, go work at Target. <laughs> what, 
<laughs> you did that. Now you want to do this. Okay. You were a chef. Now you want to be an accountant. Fine. You were an accountant. You want to be a chef. Okay. Like this, it, once you're in on it, once you're in on it, then you can, Ryan can do it. Where does Ryan want to go next? Yeah. And I'm, see, I'm excited by that. And I see where you're going. I'm like, I'm going to, I'm going to emulate this because I'm into <laughs> it and I believe in it. And it, cause you're being, you're being led by love and you're being led by this open heartedness to sort of like believe in the journey. But I think I've seen, I've, I've, there was somebody you interviewed by someone actually related to this book. And he said something in the, in the preamble to the interview. And it kind of made me think this thing is like, Oh, he was a, he was a pastor, I believe still in the church. And he was like, you know, we, we all wish that Rob was still, in the fold, like fighting the good fight for us. And I feel like that's sort of this thing that has sort of perhaps been put on you that you've probably shed years ago, but someone like me who is, has a distance from institutional Christianity still is fascinated by the people inside fighting to right the wrongs, to get rid of all this harmful bullshit that's been put around Jesus's story and name. And you were one of those guys for so many people for so long. And it's not that you're not doing that work. It's just, it's, how do you feel when people say, well, I wish Rob would just be like, stay within it and fight within this, the nastiness that's arisen in, in Christianity. How does that make you feel? Oh, that's just like the most boring thing ever I've ever heard. I have no horse in that race. I don't even know what the person is talking about. I just, I just... <laughs> If I was looking at my laptop screen, it would just have that Apple rainbow death wheel. It would just be like, <laughs> whatever. That's fine. That's fine. You can do whatever you want. So, it's, it's, okay. So let's, yeah, no, I, I'm, I totally, I that's totally. That's your problem right I, there. I, yeah. That's the problem. That's the problem right there. But like the good fight. Uh, yeah. You, I don't even need to know anything more. That's your fundamental premise. Like the fight, well, you're already in trouble. Well, that, that's then. So no, that's notice how mind how, how the mind works. Well, guess what? It's gonna feel like probably gonna feel like a fight. Fights are exhausting. <laughs> I used to go. I used to go to this boxing club with uh, the great Frank Perez Jr., this former pro fighter. Like he trained for years. He trained me, and one day I got in the ring with him. Just got my ass kicked. <laughs> I mean. Just, I couldn't get anywhere near him. I did not hit him once. And he just tagged me like once in the head. And I was like, God, this, this is the worst. It hurt. I just, he rang my bell, literally. Like, just, whoa. So, like fighting, you know what I mean? Like, like if, so just notice how you, like, yeah. If that's the, if that's the story, you're already in trouble. Totally. And in the book, Where'd you park your spaceship? I noticed this very interesting reference of Mary, and it's the center where the birth is, but the character, the lead character, the protagonist, Heen, doesn't really know what that is in reference to. And I oh, think yeah, that like, yeah. as, a, as a very interesting I'm, way of being like, does Christianity <laughs> exist? And I think maybe this is an interesting place to go from here. Was that <laughs> was that a little a little nugget to be like, people don't know what Christianity is here and I love is, it. Yeah. I love how he and he like when at that one point when Vo hands him that thing and there's a, an actual voice and he's like, "Is this a phone?" So I love that there are no cars, no phones, and he'll like he calls classical music horse music because he heard that it's made by a bow that comes from the tail of horse. So so what I love is the is like generations later what endures of a culture and how people get like bits and pieces of something like wasn't your didn't your uncle play for the dodgers mm, he yeah he worked at the stadium in the six like you like the way that people give fragments of a thing that happened um you know what i mean like how things filter down i don't know why they call it a what whatever why do they call it a ferris wheel i just you know what i mean like, was there a guy named ferris like think of how many why is it murphy's law who was murphy what happened to Murphy that the one thing we, the law we have from him is that that shit goes left. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, so that's what I love in the book is how he, every once in a while, he does like, uh, I don't know why, I don't know where that is or what that, I think it's called this or he's a little bit fuzzy on some of this stuff. <laughs> yeah. 
So there's a there's a Mary and a Karis, birth and death. I don't know I don't know where that comes from, but that's just what we call it. Which is how we are about tons of stuff that at one point had all this meaning and such. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It, so let's actually just in case if anyone's listening to this and hasn't read the book yet, like just to just to set it up as it's obviously very dense and complicated <laughs> to explain. This is a post Earth world. Uh, yeah. The Earth was brown balled. We we're now ex- seeing sort of the human race and maybe other, maybe it's not Who even knows? human. Who knows what it is? But it's it's interplanetary. He, he, yeah, now. the humans. It's it's pretty much humans hanging out. Yeah, some pretty animals, much a couple humans. animals. It's a post. The Earth has been destroyed by mm-hmm. sort of unfettered capitalism and and climate change has destroyed it and people have escaped, and so we're talking about that kind of future that's what we're describing here when we're talking about sort of the fragments and what's left over yeah and, sort of, and the journey that these people go on this idea came to you sort of like as a as a, a wave just it just hit you as inspiration and it just would it would not escape you until you sort of it like poured out of you this and i'm wondering just as a creative you the creative me the as well in to a degree it's just like what that experience is like when it's like i have to write this and i have to dedicate my whole being to put this on the page what what is that experience like when something hits you like that in in the creative sense yeah stories yeah it's like uh it all it creates its own rule of life like okay so how am i this is how am i going to arrange my life so that i can be true to this it's almost like entering into a relationship with it and uh so yeah life gets yeah my life gets very it's very simple it becomes a very simple life there's a couple things that i'm making and so other things sort of recede into the background and so what you eat sleep move the body so that you can be clear and fresh so that i can make the next thing so it was it was there have been other books and then there were teachings and then uh tours and so so i have been doing this for a while and it it was like a fidelity to it and then there's also like a holding it loosely because some ideas you give them some things come in and you give them a lot of energy and then one day go god this is rubbish (laughs) Like there are books in my computer that just never came out because they're just like, eh. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what that was. You're just so you just get very used to putting lots of paint on lots of pieces. I got all these paintings I've done surrounding me, so I'm thinking these paintings like some of them are just rubbish. Some of them I really like, and so anybody. So if you're gonna do this, then I don't know what the batting average is, but I, um, in my experience, you don't just sit down and make something great. You just keep making things and then over time some of them are like yeah i'm gonna sh- i'm gonna put that out yeah that one it's like it makes you smell <laughs> just hold it it's so so the answer to your question is there there is a paradox at the heart of it where you give yourself to it and you hold it loosely at the same time that's how i would say how it is like this is literally what i'm doing with my mind and body and soul and spirit this is I'm ranging my life so I can make this and yeah, who knows what, who knows, who knows uh, you, you, you might've emailed me about doing an interview or you might've been like, he's got something, what he's got 10 pages in and be like, he's lost. What is this? This book sucks. <laughs> Tossed it in the recycling and went on with your life. You know what I mean? You have no idea. You have no idea how to be received or I just know what it did in me. I just know what it's doing in me. So it's very, very intimate and personal. Yeah. And on that front, so it's interesting, right? Because if you were to kind of describe like what the book was, is roughly about in the past, if you said, what if love (laughs) wins about, what is everything spirit? You could, you could say a sentence and be like, okay, but is this, is that the whole point is that you, you don't really want to say what it's about because it's personal to you. But the idea is just the reader should take whatever they want out of it, which sort of makes it sort of a different sort of thing or are you able to say this is the gist of what I would describe this book as? Well, I could tell you some of the story, but what it means or what it 
I don't know. What's it mean to you? That's that's the fun of it. And and I spent years. My work was here's what I'm telling you. Here's what it means. Let me explain it. Here's what I just explained to you. Here's another way to explain it. Here's a third way to explain it. Here's a way you could think about this. And here's a way this can shape actual ways that you live every day. And by the way, here's how to explain that. Here's what I just told you. By the way, can I just tell you it to you again to make sure that you understand? You see what I'm saying? So part of so going back to you, uh, uh, maybe three questions ago, story does for me have a allure and it's compelling for lots of reasons, but um, one of them is I spent years explaining. And so part of the what your your question you're asking about Jesus the Christ is like, hey, do you just want to be done explaining? Because that's a thing. That's fine. That's fine. It's great. Good. What a great chapter. But you don't have to. You don't have to. It's like Ryan, that thing you were doing. You don't have to. You don't have to explain everything. And actually, maybe for the rest of your life, the or wherever, maybe the next chapter, you don't explain anything. Like, look at this. Look at this. <laughs> Look at this thing. What it like this painting? What the heck? And I love it. I don't know what it is. I don't know why. I was dropping this these different blotches of red, and the higher I dropped them, the more it thrilled me. I don't. I don't know. I don't know. You know what I mean? Or my my wife was like, "Hey, she got a new uh, cutting board in the kitchen." She's like, hey, do you want the old one? It's like, of course I want the old one. You know what I mean? Of course I want the old one. Or this, like this thing right here. Look at this. Like I go to the lumber yard and there's this bin of free lumber and I fill my backpack with these chunks of wood and ride my bike home and then like make stuff with it. And like, see what I mean? Like, I don't, what, explain it. What? <laughs> no, not. I love that, especially with art and this different way of sort of putting out things. And it's like it's like artists don't like to explain the songs because it's like if I tell you what I was what I was literally going through, it's not going to be that mind blowing thing that makes you think of your your wife or your it might relationship. Be right. And yet, telling this story, I've had like you were just talking, giving an overview. I've had more personal, global ecological economic discussions like like this book the conversations i've had with people about this book have been of a completely like a like a kind of intimacy and connection and love and political climate um consciousness like how we love each other you know what i mean so you surrender all that, and then what it, it, to, to, to follow this story that ends up saying more than anything I've ever said before, which is what a number of people have said. They're like, "Oh, you like think you like walk? You think you're doing something different here, man? Come on." <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, because like you can see the themes of of your work, the sort of thinking to the future, where we're headed with all this, what it's all about the ideas of, of, of suffering and how that affects our life, choosing where to go and um, the company we keep. And what I love about it, one thing my favorite part about it is, is the teachers, Heen's teachers. Oh, for, yeah, for yeah. And, and it, it just made me realize, it's like, you know, I, I started this off by saying, you're, you're one of these people who like, you know, the teaching, the thoughts you put out there were really influential and make me think deeper about things. But one person that the last time we talked, I didn't even know who this person was. And I came afterwards, I realized I was like, oh, man, I could see the the connection between you and his work. And that's Richard Rohr, um, mm. who I think is, is such an amazing sort of deep thinker on all the issues that um, that I see flowing out of this book, mysticism and non-dual thinking and just an open heartedness to all traditions and faith. Tell me about Richard Rohr's sort of influence on you and your thinking, because I feel mm. I feel like he must he must have played a played a big role at some point. I do remember is everything belongs is that the book is that a book of his I remember 2000 I don't know when that book came out but 
2000, when I was early 30s, probably early 30s, coming across his, coming across him and Actually, I remember. I remember thinking, "Oh, now this is a village elder." That that uh, I had been talking to a physical therapist who said that he was traveling in India, and in the villages he was working at in India, he said the older people got, the more loose and limber and flexible they got. And I remember that just was so like not my image of aging in America at every level, not just physical, but like, and with Richard Rohr, I, I, I distinctly remember it was like a whole new world opened up of growing younger as you grow older, like opening up, like expanding as you, as you are old. So that even raises questions. What even is time? What even is aging? But no, he, so it, for me, my experiences of him and becoming friends with him was a, was about his life, how he lived, it, it, how he lived. Like this is somebody like, like there's a vitality and a curiosity and a and a like open of evolving, expanding sort of presence that was like. What was, what's he, 60, 70, 72, 74? Like, as I just, like, oh, it was like a, it was like a whole new, oh, that's the, that's, that's what we're doing here. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Yeah. It was very, very, yeah, huge, huge. I find him to be such a important thinker. And I think the way he talks about God and Jesus are just to be so trippy and mind blowing in all, in all the right ways. And there was a thing he said that sort of sticks with me, like sort of one of the things that really can like, I guess, you know, like ground me and, and see, I see a trajectory in my life and this whole idea of like including and transcending, like you mm -hmm. include and transcend. And I see mm -hmm. that as, as sort of themes in, in your work as well. And like I said, our experience last time, like, yeah, what's, why would I hate Muslims? Or like, what's wrong with Muslims? I know Muslims, they're amazing, loving people. Why would I be against transgender? I would be fighting against gravity. And in the process of doing that in my own life and, you know, that's what's helped me to transcend. And I'm wondering too, sort of your comments on that idea of in your own life, including and transcending. And also, of course, the themes in this book of this character who's going around and, and meeting all sorts of different people and letting their sort of his experiences sort of like seep into his own heart and he just gets bigger <laughs> and it just turns him into this, this very dangerous in the right way kind of person. Like he's just fearless. And so I wonder this idea of include and transcend and maybe you've seen it in your own life and see it kind of pouring out in your work. Does that, does that resonate with you as an idea? Yeah. You can't be at odds with yourself and you have to own every square inch of your story. So it's not like you leave, you are, you continue to transcend, but you, you continue to, 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 to expand and move forward, but you also embrace all the pieces that came before and yeah so all of it played a role all of it helped shape me into who i am so there's a sort of deep gratitude and so anger about that or i'm embarrassed because i used to think that or shame because i Look at me, I was just an idiot. What was I? I was so air like all the ways we can beat ourselves up don't really get us anywhere interesting. So there's a grace and love that we have for ourselves. Otherwise we're split. We got these bits and pieces that it's like that thing when someone you went to you run into somebody you went to college with and like, remember that time we and you're like, Oh god, please don't you're immediately like, what are they gonna bring up? And am I gonna be like so embarrassed? as opposed to just doubling down. Yeah, I was just a moron. That's a great story. I remember that. Yeah. Instead of flinching, you know what I mean? Instead of that awful feeling like they're going to bring up something that is the last thing on earth I want them to bring up. Um, you smile and you lean into it and you go, yeah. And then like the way, I mean, if you wish you would have been a better parent or you went through a 
horrible breakup in a relationship or you made a bunch of choices that really affected other people that those sorts of things can haunt us. So this work of no, it all belongs, make amends where you need to. Uh, in the Tao Te Ching, they talk about the master. Master goes into what's difficult, um, cleans up the mistakes, and it's all part of it. It's all part of it. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, yeah. Otherwise, you're at odds with yourself, and then you have to take that tension and pain, and usually just put it on someone else. They're the enemy. They're. You just find another person to point at when it's actually your own terror about yourself. In the process of some sort of transcendent experience, you you use the words in the book. I highlighted a deep deep knowing that some of the characters sort of arrive at. And how would you how would you def, would you would you define that deep knowing? Because I think it's it's kind of related to all the things we're talking about. And I think it's yeah sort of yeah that, that authority to speak so confidently on these issues and just you're you know unflappable in terms of these thoughts you have about you know big issues. Uh, you're learning that your thoughts and emotions, feelings, senses, and perceptions are all things that are happening within you, that there's a you, an infinite, indestructible you. So if I were to say point to Ryan and you were to point to yourself, I'd say, no, you're pointing to your body. So for most people, their body is, body is the outer boundary of the self. And then the question is, what's happening in the body? Is there a soul? Is there something eternal, immortal? Is there a spirit, et cetera? But your body is actually made of cells. About a million cells are dying a second. Your body is also creating new cells that continue to make you. So your body is actually coming and going. You and I met eight years ago. We actually had different bodies then. So your body swaps itself out about what are seven, eight, nine years. Every seven, eight, nine years, you get a whole new body. So right now, your body and my body, our bodies are actually coming and going. Part of our body is dying and fading. Another, our body is also regenerating. So when, if I were to say point to you, you, you could point to your body. I'd like, no, you're pointing to your, that's your body. So as opposed to you, Ryan is not something happening in Ryan's body. Ryan's body is something happening in larger Ryan. So the one thing you know for sure, and everybody listening to your podcast knows, is that some, there's somebody here having an experience. There's yeah. some sense of I, and there's some sense of I that is being but you can't, the one thing you know for sure, your body itself is coming and going. So that's not stable. That's just like a, a thing happening within you. So as you become, and this is just actual observations that we all can agree on. So as you become more grounded in what a self even is, you realize that the thing that you know for sure exists, which is there's some I having an experience, an I having an am, an I am, can't be located in any physical, material, tangible way. So your thoughts are arising and then passing. Your emotions, sadness, anger, so, uh, joy, euphoria. So all of these experiences that you know to be your Ryan life are happening within this I am-ness. So even the sense of time speeding up and slowing down, um, People talk about an event just took forever. Another event flew by. So if there is a you that can observe time speeding up and slowing down, then there's a you that's outside of time. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to observe time in its passing and slowing. How are we doing so far? <laughs> yeah, I'm with you. So there is a timeless, eternal, infinite, indestructible, actual Ryan within which all of these experiences are happening. So essentially, when people use the word meditation, meditation is simply the intentional resting in the you who is observing all that is arising within you. So this will completely change your life. Because then as opposed to, for most people, their experience of the sense, perception, emotion, or feeling is so completely bonded to their sense of self that I am angry. I am the anger. That's all there is right going on right now, anger, as opposed to, oh, look, I got a lot of anger about that, observing and noticing it. Um, oh, 
note you are learning to notice all that is rising within you and not attaching to it it's just a thought it'll come it'll go like other thoughts most and then if you ask most people do you have a negative voice that runs constantly in your head and it's quite judgy and shamey <laughs> and kind of makes you miserable well then you are learning to observe that voice and not take it seriously. Just let it say whatever it's going to say. And what will happen over time is you'll get better and better. Oh, here comes that voice again. Here comes that voice telling me I'm unworthy. Oh, look at it. You begin to laugh at it. You begin to see it simply as a voice within you. And what will happen over time is that voice will go away. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> That's I, I like love... a, history of, a history of the awareness of awareness in no, like 90 absolutely. seconds. And I mean, that's 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 sort of the the clue to it. And I think, you know, I, we talked about this, like interaction, transcendent experience and, you know, meeting the Christ, which talking to Jesus, which some people might hear you and think you're crazy. I hear you and be like, oh, cool. Like I can relate. I wouldn't describe it in the same way, but I totally get what you're talking about. And I was saying, like, when you it, you talked about that coming to that understanding, a lot of people get there through through meditation there's also a big conversation these days about sort of like drugs and psychoactive drugs and psychedelics yeah, and sure. natural yeah. products. Where do you stand on that? I'm, I, I will cut this out if you don't mean to put it in, but do you, do you dabble in that realm at all? Is it something that's been fruitful for you? Oh spiritual? yeah, absolutely. For a lot of people, plant medicine, yeah, yeah. Plant medicine can, um, or yeah, psychedelics, like, oh, this is what the monks were talking about. Got it. And a lot of times the monks are like, yeah, you can take this. You can take the elevator if you want, but we're just there. So you can have that experience with your friends out at Joshua Tree. You know what I mean? That's great. Um, oh yeah, and you're gonna you're, we're just gonna have a a wonderful explosion coming as all this becomes legal and people and even right even even just some of the like Johns Hopkins some of the research on psilocybin and trauma literally people healing from PTSD. But those experiences, yes, these experiences for me have been absolutely extraordinary. Are you comfortable Just talking about anything you've blowing. dabbled with or it's not something you like to get into? It's, that's not dab. Uh, yeah, I don't use the word dabble. Oh, dabble. Can you tell me a story? I'm totally open. I would love to hear it. I would really love to hear it. And like specifics, the more specific, the better. Uh, nah, maybe sometime. Yeah, honestly, it's so... God, what's the word? My experiences have been so healing and sacred and uh, uh, what is the transformative that uh, and I I see how you know when somebody tries to push something on you and hypes it that some things are so powerful that unless they call to you no uh, you know what i mean like they um they call to you and then you follow that um so even the the I had a number of experiences of people like, almost like, what's the word? Like, you're missing out, man. You gotta, you need to. And then I was like, I was on the receiving end of a number of that, that I was like, oh, I'm never gonna do that. Cause that's a terrible, it, it made me like, ah, just, just get, out, get out of my face. Um, so I, I, that's why I'm not like Mr. Salesman. Cause I'm like, oh, it'll, I just, there's a smile and a nod, like with you, like, yeah, yeah. But see, yeah, <laughs> and in, in, in the in, I'm trying to be more transparent in my life and in these conversations. Yeah. And thing mm -hmm. is, I've only I've 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 only gone as far as weed. And I'm telling you, Rob, like the most tr on the smallest amount, I'm talking about like half a puff. I'm telling you, meeting God itself. And oh, I, well, and yeah, my friend, there's a for, whole buffet. But you can. But, but what I'm saying and see, but that's why I. I I do. I dabble in it very irregularly, and I swear what you just said really resonated with me. It's like you, I feel something so deep in me, like it's time to like think think about these things 
yes. in, in a new way. And I feel the, I, exactly how you just described it, like called to it, like once every six months, once every three months, whenever I just feel something, we could call it spirit, we could call it whatever, that just calls me to it. And I think what I've been wrestling, and that's why I just like that you're kind of affirming in your own way, this sort of like sacredness of it is you kind of start to worry that you're like, oh, it's because I was high or, oh, how do you, can you talk oh, about yeah. that a so, little bit about discrediting so, those experiences because of uh, any altered state? So, um, God, I, there's a, I live at the foot of a mountain and I was hiking yesterday or the day before, like any altered state that puts you in, it, it puts you in, uh, that, that kind of space. It's, it, uh, it's fundamentally non-addictive. The last thing you do is want to do this again because you have experienced something that then asks you to integrate it and put flesh and blood on it so that it becomes more how your life is, more connected, more loving, more aware, more firm and fierce. So um, in my experience, what happens is you you taste and see something that is then like, okay, now how does this almost like leak or how does this saturate every day? It's like, that's nice. So if you stay too, so if you stay too long on top of the mountain, you're in trouble. <laughs> you're on the top of the mountain. You hear what you need to hear, then get back down to the valley and start, you know, carrying water and chopping wood. Absolutely. And I don't, do you know who James Finley is? He works with Roar as well. He's, um, works at the CAC. I've heard that name. I think, yeah, I, I think you'd love him. I interviewed him last year and it was a really great experience. And I asked him kind of this question a little bit. And he said something that you kind of reiterated there a little bit, this idea of it can be a very transformative experience, but it should be sort of grounding you in the concreteness of your own life. If you're only mm -hmm. using it as an escape. And I kind of heard that a little bit, what you said. And I totally agree with that from my own experience that it makes me want to be a better friend be kinder to my parents and sort of in that pure sober state. So it's nice to hear that, but it's so easy to dismiss it and not want to talk about it in the sense that people will. Um, but of course, leading into sort of being able to do that in a sober state is also exciting to feel that same feeling. The, the remnants yeah. of it are always there. Yeah. And, and that's another, uh, another thing is creating another in like oh you got to do this or you're gonna i just i that's why i always just hesitate is like oh yeah you're missing out if you would you know what i mean you just create another group of people who are like we get it you don't we have these i just <laughs> um the the concept of the book like a post earth world you know these days especially is a premise in which is not only interesting, but believable to so many people. Um, and I'm wondering if you see this post Earth living on interplanetary worlds as like a foregone conclusion that we're headed in that direction, maybe not foregone conclusions, a bit too definitive, but is it where you see everything headed? And is it part of sort of your spiritual sort of thinking on what's next and how to think about life no. itself, you know? Yeah, no, I don't. Uh, no, I don't. And the, that's why the book, I, I can see how in some ways what the book is doing is taking this very real fear that is in the air and the book just goes, well, let's just take worst case scenario. The, the book is worst case scenario happened, which I, which I, I think is a, a very, very compelling Take your worst fear and then put yourself, it happened. Put yourself, put yourself after it happened. Um, what does that do to your attachment to the fear and the ways in which we have these horrible terrors and then we keep bringing them up for very good reason, but is there a degree to which we keep them alive? That person is a nasty, horrible bully. That person is a nasty, ho horrible bully. That person is a nasty, horrible bully. At what point am I 
creating, am I participating in creating this by the very thought structures that can only see them as that? Um, and I mean, just think about the shock and outrage of the algorithms. That man is a dangerous, dangerous man. That man is a dangerous man. That man is a dangerous man. I'm going to click another article about that man being a horrible man. Hey, look at, he just won. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like to what degree do all the people who were repulsed by this man helped participate in this man coming to power or whatever situation it is. I, it's fa we despise these things, are repulsed by these things, hate these things, and can often become so attached to that thought, emotion, sense, perception that we actually keep it in play. So it was really interesting to me as the story started to, uh, to unfold, oh, at some level, what I did was take my worst, democracy, democracy is an experiment. I mean, at, even just this democracy has had serious, serious threats the past few years, like real serious threats. Well, just go ahead and down the road. It's an experiment. It failed. I take the worst. So in, in the work that I do with people, oftentimes when I sit across from somebody and I'm taking them I'm asking them questions. Uh, people come to me with a question. They're stuck on something. And then I start asking them questions and we watch them get unstuck. But what's interesting to me is how many people have a, a, something that is present, with a fear that is within them. And it's never been spoken because it's too, it's too terrifying to actually speak it. So I, can, I think of a woman this summer who you could see it. You could just see it on her. And so... And there was a group of people, um, and so I invited her to speak the truth. And then she said, because she's, she's more curious and hungry and learning and growing more than ever, and she is married to somebody who is kind of fine with how things are. And you see her terror, and it's just building. Like There's like no release valve for it. So it's just like the lid is on the pot, the pot, you know, the water is starting to boil. So I said, you can just, you know, how about just say it? And you could see her like, what the? And then she said, my marriage might not survive. And it was like a full body, like relief and release. You know what I mean? Like I've just, and that's neither here nor there. Just saying the most terrifying thing and realizing, oh, I can say that and I'm still here. So you can see how this thing is like haunting her. It's like, it's the, it's the thing in the shadow. We, that is, that, we don't say that. We don't say that. We don't say that. We don't say that. That's the beauty of comedians. That's why comedians have such a profound role in our midst. Because they go, oh, really? You got issues with your body? Oh, really? You got weird stuff happening in your head about sex? Oh, uh, race? You're white. I'm black. I'm black. You're white? Like, oh, you, you think what? You know what I mean? They just say it. That's the job. The job is to say the thing that everybody has been holding down and they say it and there's like this whoosh. You know what I mean? There's like this explosive cathartic thing that happens because <laughs> the, they said Bill Burr, this, there's an American comedian named Bill Burr who basically yeah. says the thing that everybody has agreed. You're not allowed to say, and he's genius because he knows and everybody goes, Oh, it loses its power. Because he just says it, and he's still up there on the stage with a microphone. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> totally. So it's interesting, right? Because I think the, the work that, that you're doing is just this idea of being in present, right? And enjoying the wonders around us now and, and enjoying life and finding a way to sort of, you know, have purpose as, as the characters in, in these books are, are looking for that purpose and understanding what they're here for and what they're good at and all that. So this, the, the anxiety that is taking over the world in some ways about is the earth going to end and what's next? You're not necessarily perhaps preoccupying yourself with that because that in some ways is such a distraction from the here and the now. Is that true? Or are you, are you kind of getting caught up in these anxieties about it's getting bad? I just know so many people who are growing their own food and buying less clothes, but clothes that are made by companies that are working to make the entire production line sustainable. And people who are like, there's just so many great, that Patagonia just gave 
the company to the earth. The first company that was is now owned by the earth, essentially. <laughs> like, they're just down the street from where I live. Like, I just know, and so many people were never thinking about any of this and now are. Like, people are living there, like putting solar panels on their houses and living off the electricity of the sun. And countries are like, like, there's just so much massive explosion of awareness around these issues. Think about, just think about uh, the organic food section at the grocery store. It used to be six things. Now it's a whole corner of the store. Uh, the entire grocery industry in America looks to see what Whole Foods is doing. Uh, so it may be more expensive, but the whole industry is looking at how to do organic and healthy. Um, and people are realizing that we have completely missed out. We don't know what things cost. We just want cheap food. Well, then we pay for it in our healthcare system. So people are realizing, oh, actually, slightly more expensive food is actually far more affordable because of all the other ways we pay for it. So you even have people going, what is cost? Yeah, so you have people going, I used to think that that shirt was too expensive, but I bought five shirts for that price, and all of them I wore out in two years. Uh, so maybe I should have just cried once and bought the shirt that was more money because it would have outlasted and I would have ended up wearing it more than those five, and I'd still have it and still love it. So you just have people realizing that cost itself and the obsession with the free market about making everything as cheap and possible actually has ended up costing us way more. So so the idea that the whole thing is going off a cliff, I don't know, I just not I just see so many people doing so many interesting new things. Um, but, but if I mean I I don't know, if you were just reading CNN, you, the outrage machine or if you were just if you were literally just reading the news you would have a completely different view because the news isn't the news it says it's the news but it's not the news so i got a couple wrap-up questions are you cool with that okay my, 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 my yes let's go let's wrap just, them up okay how we wrap this up who knows I, but i got a couple <laughs> I, I, yeah yeah i would be remiss if i didn't ask you about this and you mentioned comedian it was the per perfect segue but through my um you know knowledge of you and being into your work i became a huge fan of pete holmes and you know i listened to his podcast i've listened to <laughs> you guys speak for hours and hours on that and him coming on yours and i think you guys met on his podcast and i just it's just a general like talk to me about your relationship with pete holmes and how, how he's you know as a friend but also he's such a spiritual guy and i love listening to him talk about life and suffering and all the things that we're talking about and that you write about tell me about your relationship with with pete holmes. oh yeah. yeah he's my neighbor we chop it up I literally, in a couple hours, I'll go to the farm. The, there's a local farmer's market, and we usually see each other there on Thursday afternoons. I'll, I'll, there's a good chance I'll see him in, this afternoon. Yeah, and we'll, sit, we'll, sit, we'll sit around or we'll, sh yeah, we'll shoot the breeze. Oh, yeah, that's my guy. We did, actually, when, when the book came out, we did a thing at, at this club in Los Angeles, and he asked, he like, we had this discussion slash interview about the book, but man, he asked such great questions and it was, it was just wonderful. Mm -hmm. So I see him, I literally will see him around like in the car and stuff. Like, What's up? <laughs> Has he helped you grow and expand in thinking and stuff? Cause I know he's a deep thinker and I'm sure he's challenged your thinking in terms of like how he sees the world. He's a very, you know, opinionated guy and obviously very eloquent when he, when he talks is, is there anything about your relationship that you've seen as sort of, you know, having a really, Deep impact oh yeah, well, when we first yeah. Be, yeah, 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 yeah. When we first became friends, uh, that was two thousand. So I had the world that I came from. I can see now how uh, the world that I came from. There are certain things that everybody's agreed not to talk about. Whether it's politeness, whether it's the democratic nature of a spiritual community where like we're all in this together, but ever so subtly there are like you, I don't know how to explain it, but every tribe, every culture, every system, every family system has like, this is what we talk about. This is what we don't. And health is essentially learning to talk about all the stuff we don't talk about. But when I met Pete, and I 
noticed on stage, but but actually just hanging around my house or just at our, our just us being friends. Whenever there was something that would come up that was like culturally or even personally, like I don't almost like yeah, we don't we you know we kind of move past that. The the comedian that's like red meat for the comedian. The comedian goes why. Why don't the comedian goes right in that like that tender place and is like why why don't we talk about that what do you mean what it, like they just they just come to life like a little red light starts blinking on their dashboard and and then they talk about it and riff on it and yell about it and vent and you're la you're shocked and you're laughing and but you're laughing and it's like a release valve for the soul. So, yeah, Pete, yeah, because I came from, like, teacher world. Like, this is this pattern. This is how this, and Pete came from, just turned the mic on. I got divorced. Here's what happened. Here's who I had sex with. Here's what happened with mushrooms. I hate this. I despise this. I love that. I think you should try this. It, um, it, was, it was, it was, it was really a gift to me. It's really a gift to me. There was this one. <laughs> there's one quick thing. This this spiritual thought that he said. I'd love to get your your quick take on it, if if you don't mind. Um, he was talking on his podcast. I think he was quoting someone else when he he was talking about this thing about like we have to be good so that God is good. And to me, that was very interesting. Maybe like panentheist type of thing to say in a way that God is in everything and we are sort of God moving things forward or something. Does that, what does that, does that idea ring true to you in any way? Or is it interesting to you to say we have to be good so that God is good? Thoughts and ideas aren't as interesting to me as they used to be. Um, even something like a topic. So, 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 we generally are obsessed with other experiences we're having. I had this experience. You had your experience. So, so for most of us, our fundamental lens is separation. I have my experience. You have your experience. You can also move to the wholeness of a universe that is one. And there is Ryan having his experience. I can also see Ryan is an uni experience the universe is having. I am an experience the universe is having. It is one, and then it manifests in particulars just for the sheer joy of it. So <laughs> Rob Bell is an experience the universe is having. Ryan is an experience the universe is having. And when you do that, then uh, I stop comparing and competing because, oh, look at the good that came Ryan's way. Look what Ryan's good at. Uh, look at the unity. If I begin with unity, this gets much more interesting. So then you could, is the, the universe is God witnessing God. <laughs> like it just all gets much more interesting. Uh, and that's just, so, so then the discussion, so then what you're talking about just becomes far more interesting. Or is the divine, when people use this word God, generally when people use this word God, they're talking about an object. They're talking about, an, and the object generally is like a super powered version of humans, generally believes like is a bigger version but is, is stronger and more powerful but it's an object among objects well i don't know what people mean by this word god but i would say generally i think people are trying to get at ultimate reality they're trying to speak of that of which nothing greater could be conceived well the word generally then as practiced is people are talking about an object among objects things among things a, a super a being among beings bigger, stronger, wider, eternal, whatever, but still a being among beings. I simply would see it completely differently if I had to actually think about it. Um, what is it that things arise out of? The universe itself, objects. Um, it would have to be something that wasn't an object. It would have to be something formless, because these are all forms, colors, shapes, sizes, books. Ideas even have form. So if there is ultimate reality, one way to think about it would be it would have to be some sort of formless, empty spaciousness. 
some way, in many ways, it's the starting point of Buddhism. It doesn't begin with an egoic structure surrounding an object who wants to be worshipped and send you out into the world to spread that. It begins with an empty, formless spaciousness, the, an unknowing. You can't, the, the mind is just checks out at that point. Uh, so I, I tend, and, and then think about all the great moments in Ryan's life, your life, when you, the moments of guidance, the moments of peace, the moments of transcendence. Generally, there's a stillness and a spaciousness that is free of thoughts, ideas. It's uncluttered. The mind has shut down and it's just pure being. And out of that, something arose. So, so, so most of the time when people use the word God, I don't know what they're talking. I, I kind of, I, I, I don't relate. Because my understanding is is the thing after the thing, <laughs> the thing under before. Uh, that's just all much more compelling to me, and real, and uh, yeah. You can even see that, like you can see this in the prophets. You can see this in even Moses is like keeps. You can't make it. It's even you can see it all sorts of different ways. Like, nah, you can't make statues can't make carvings <laughs> these people go no whatever it is whatever is ultimate it doesn't it doesn't mm -mm. it doesn't have shape doesn't have form so that's why when people just go okay we won't make statues we'll just make doctrines you know what i mean we'll just have just thoughts that are essentially just objects that we just no mm -mm. it will have to be something spacious a certain sort of emptiness that is actually no thing because no thing is, if you were to describe to me what no, nothing is, it would have, nothing would have no borders or boundaries. If it had borders or boundaries, it would be a thing. But if I asked you what's everything, you'd be like, well, everything can't have any borders or boundaries. Because it, then it wouldn't be everything. So everything and nothing have the same definition. That's how I'd answer your question. <laughs> you, want, you get to take a little puff now. <laughs> I, dude, if you want to light up, I will light up and we'll go viral. Let's go viral. No, but you, you, you made me think of another question, but I'm afraid to ask because I really don't want to. I, I, I want to let you go if you have to go, but you just it was Do one more. OK, so it, non dual thinking right comes up in the thing. And I think Western Christianity, I can speak of my own experience. Maybe you can relate. It just wasn't really a part of the conversation that I really learned this whole there. There was a right and a wrong and a black and a white. And uh, when we talk about suffering, right? And there's a lot of suffering in the book in where'd you park your spaceship and how that sort of flourishes mm -hmm. and the thing. But there was a moment that jumped out at me where you basically say that he sort of recognized suicide for the first time and he understood it for the first yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm just like fascinated and just emotionally distraught by this idea of suicide because it's like in my life, suffering has led part of these transcendent experiences you are and I are talking about. And that trajectory makes absolute sense. And it works out for the characters in this book so far. I know this is part one. It seems to have worked out in your life. It absolutely worked out in my life because my life is awesome despite all the trauma, all the suffering, right? It's like, but so many people, it's too much to bear that suffering. Yeah. And the lights yeah. go out. And I know you put that line in there and it just, it really, you know, I don't know what it's, I know what it's like to get it. Although I don't, I've, I've never had that thought that I want to do it, but so many millions and millions of people do it. How can mm -hmm. we, how, how do you, how do you wrestle with that? And I yeah. think it makes sense. Of yeah. it, but if you could, if you could talk about that, I would, I would love that. And the way that he, like, he doesn't say it. It's, he just says it. Like he does, it doesn't have, yeah. It, yeah, it called into question the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah, and you think about we all we all nod our heads with the phrase unconditional love. Something within us, unconditional love. Yes. You know what I mean? Even like, yes, it speaks to some tender, intimate, vulnerable place within us. Like, yes, unconditional love. 
But unconditional love means I love you if you're here and choose to stay here, and I and I love you if you go. Uh, and it speaks to whatever this experience, this incarnation, this appearance, this Ryan who showed up at this time and place, some eternal essence, some boundless soul that chose to get in the body and come to wherever you are. You know what I mean? Um, it also speaks to something within us knows that this run we're having here, this 77 year run or 16 year run or 102 year experience, something within us just goes, yeah, we'll have this experience, but it's not like that's it. And you have you have all people for thousands of years where you here before in some other form and then you came back and this you where do you go next like this has been a human like we've never stopped feeling this and talking about this even all of the alien stuff is like just this consciousness do not tell me that consciousness is limited to this space time continuum in this body even my dad died in June, and I have had a communion with him and his spirit more intimate and authentic. And sometimes it feels like than when he was alive. Like I get, I get him. I get us. I'm more grateful. Even the weirdness between us, I has like a transcendent include to it. So he weirdly died and then was closer than ever. Uh, so I just going to your thing about life and death, actual, actual resurrection means you come to see that even life and death themselves are existing within something larger. Who knows? So it makes the whole game so fascinating. That makes what's meant the game so riveting. That makes it so like, like mysterious and compelling. And yeah, there, I think there's no thought that makes me believe that there has to be something <laughs> after this, than to be like, people wanted a way out. Reality was too hard for them, and I no longer see it through that lens of a selfish act. I know in many cases, I know there might be some cases, or or like an old school you know, destructive Christian thinking of, well, they got to go to hell for doing that or some sort of punishment for that, that there must be something after that because reality was that cruel to them and they need it out. And whatever's on the other side, you know, has to be better. I have the hope and faith that that has to be better. Um, you, um, as a last question, because I could literally go all day and the sun's starting to set in, in LA. <laughs> and um, you said this thing and I actually wrote it down. It says, what's possible here? Um, and I think that to me is sort of this, a motto in your life, it seems to be in your creative spirit, your optimism for the world. You just, you, you said it and it resonated with me and how I try to approach the day. What's possible here? And I'm wondering if you could just speak on that sort of saying and just if, you know, how you stay optimistic despite all the, the stuff that we kind of talked about, all the hardships of life. Is it this idea that there are things that we can create, there are things that that I can do to sort of, you know, make things better for myself and those around me. Is that the essence of what you might've been trying to get at when you said what's possible here? I don't have any interest in optimism. That feels like just another way to arrange your mental furniture as opposed to pessimism. Though those two as uh, I don't, I don't, whatever that is, I just have simply observed lots and lots and lots of people who, when you sit together, and you take some deep breaths and some long exhales, and you practice a little bit of self-inquiry, or someone like me just asks you questions about where you're at and what's next and what you're noticing. I've just sat with lots and lots and lots of people and watched them get clarity. Like, oh, oh, yeah, I think I'll do this next. Yeah, I got a next step here. I've always thought about a farm or a pizza place or a therapy clinic or a what going back to school for that or did it, like I just watched thousands of people 
get still and quiet, who were very frustrated and felt stuck, and then listen to their life with perhaps a little I hold up mirrors, like essentially, and like show so you can see. But I just observe people go, oh, yeah, I know. Ex yeah, that's who I am. Oh, yeah. And notice a tr thread through their life and. Oh, I could do. Yeah. Yeah, I could do that. I got it. I can see that. That's that's what that's what I'll do next. It's a very calm, grounded wonder and awe about who they are right now in this moment and what's inviting them to take a step in that direction. So it's not like a like when you asked about the earth and the climate crisis, it's not a like how do you think about where it's headed? It's my observation of people right now waking up to the beauty of the world and new ways to care for it. So it's it's imbo uh, It's just, for me, it's embodied. So that's why when you're talking about thoughts and ideas, that's great, that's fine. Discussions are nice. I just am... My... What interests me is what's happening events in time and space. So am I optimistic? I, well, I just keep watching and running into people who are alive and stepping into new futures. And it's pretty, pretty amazing. What a game. Earth school. What a wonderful thing to be a part of. Where is it headed? I have no idea. I just know I'm going to talk to my friend Chris after this and guaranteed he'll have some new thing he's thinking of or doing and it'll be thrilling to talk to him and then I'm meet up with my friend Steven at one and he's been like a mentor to me and I'll see something new because he's just got like all these gifts to give me and then I'll go to the farmer's market might run into Pete Holmes and I'll you know what I mean I'll go to my vol daughter's volleyball game after that and she's figuring out how to be an athlete and I'm so happy to be along for the ride. That's how I see it. What a wonderful thing that we get to do this. And of course it's painful. And of course there are tears and of course there's suffering. And of course, and then you do your work and you realize that a lot of that suffering was because you, you were thinking like you do the work and you find a piece, you find a piece that was there the whole time. And it's like, Oh, that's how that works. And then you take a puff or you, Go up on a mountain in a hut and try some new plant something and the heavens open up. Yeah, that's that's just, and then you go for a mountain bike ride and go for a surf and, <laughs> and write another book <laughs> and paint another painting. <laughs> there you go. It sounds like you're living the good life. Thank you so much for this time, Rob. Great talking to you. Great for, question. For, for, the, for the inspiration and just keep, keep doing your thing and... Um, my pleasure. I'm very grateful for all you've done and given. So thank you so much. My pleasure.